Let's talk about mood disorders. Major depressive disorder, subtypes of depression, bipolar disorder, the biological basis of mood disorders, cognitive theories of depression. Okay, so when it comes to mood disorders, we've got a couple categories here. Depressive disorders, this includes depression, intense and persistent sadness, which we'll define a little bit more. Um, down into the next few slides. That's the main feature. And then we've got bipolar and related disorders. So we're going to kind of distinguish between and other categories, um, borderline personality disorder versus bipolar. Because I think when a lot of people think of of bipolar, they're actually referring to borderline personality disorder. So I'll make that distinction when we get there. All right. So major depressive disorder. This is a very common uh, disorder diagnosed here in the United States. Now, the diagnostic criteria for MDD includes a depressed mood for most of the day, nearly every day, as well a loss of interest and pleasure in usual activities. And at least five of the following symptoms below uh, need to experience for at least a two-week period. And these symptoms cause, again, as always, significant distress or impairment in one's normal functioning, their ability to operate socially, occupationally, and other areas of functioning, and are not caused by substances or a medical condition. Okay? So these symptoms include weight loss or weight gain, increased or decreased appetite, of course, follows that. Um, difficulty falling asleep or sleeping too much, psychomotor agitation, fatigue, loss of energy, feeling of worth, worthlessness or guilt, difficulty concentrating, indecisiveness, as well as, unfortunately, suicidal ideation, thoughts of death, thinking about or planning one's death, uh, as well as an attempt. Now, when it comes to MDD and its prevalence. It affects about 6.6% of the population uh, each year. Again, that's each year. And almost 17% of the U.S. population in their lifetime. So that's a really significant uh, number. And it's more common among women than in men. Now, some risk factors associated with MDD include unemployment, low income, living in urban areas, as well as being separated, divorced, or widowed. Now let's look at some subtypes of depression. Seasonal pattern, okay, this is otherwise known as seasonal affective disorder, and I find the acronym a little bit comical if you can uh, make any of this comical because I don't want to shed it in any sort of uh, lighthearted, because this is a very serious topic, but whenever there's moments in here that you can try and make it lighthearted, I'm going to try to, but seasonal affective disorder is the acronym SAD. So this applies to situations in which a person experiences the symptoms of major depressive disorder, but only during a particular time of the year. For most people, they will experience seasonal affective disorder during the winter months. Again, it gets colder and uh, it the lot, it's not as uh, bright out for a long time as long as it is during the summer, so, so lack of sunshine. Some people go into work and it's dark, and then they'll leave work and it's dark because the sun sets at like six o'clock here in in the Eastern time coat, um, e Eastern time. So next is peripartum onset or postpartum depression. This is whenever individuals will experience major depression during pregnancy or in the first four weeks following the birth, more specifically, as well as dysthymia or persistent depressive disorder. So this is whenever individuals uh, have a depressed mood for most of the day, nearly every day for at least two years, as well as at least two of the other symptoms of major depression. So the key mark difference between dysthymia and major depressive disorder is that these individuals are chronically sad but they do not meet all of the criteria for major depressive major depression okay so it's two symptoms versus all the uh, the number of others for major depressive okay let's talk about bipolar disorder this involves mood states that fluctuate between depression and mania so it's a slower process these Periods of mania and depression last for at least a week. And when people refer, they think of bipolar like this constant flip flopping of a mood, but that's more so associated with borderline personality as far as the as far as the symptoms that we'll talk about down the road. But whenever an individual experiences a period of mania, this includes excessive talk. Uh, 
excessively talkative, excessively irritable, will ex exhibit a flight of ideas, so they'll talk loudly and rapid, rapidly, abruptly switching from one topic to another. So they're saying a lot of things, but it doesn't really add up to anything truly intelligible. Um, e they're easily distracted, they exhibit grandiosity especially, and inflated but uh, unjustified self-esteem and self-confidence. Show little need for sleep, take on several tasks at once, and engage in reckless behaviors. And usually the onset is before the age of 25 and affects one out of 100 people in the United States in their lifetime. Okay, so when it comes to the biological basis of mood disorders, when it comes to MDD, uh, relatives have doubled the risk of developing the disorder. And I find interesting twin studies associated with mental disorders. So Individuals who are identical twins, if one has MDD, there's a 50% concordance rate. With fraternal twins, it's a 38% concordance rate. When it comes to bipolar disorder, relatives have over a nine times risk of developing bipolar. That is a significant number. But the concordance rate is significantly different between identical versus fraternal twins in bipolar disorder. For identical, 60, there's a 67% concordance rate. And for fraternal twins, there's a 16% concordance rate. When it comes to the biological basis of mood disorders, now, they're not in, in every single case for depression is it a result of an imbalance in neurotransmitters. Are there cases that that, that is what's happening? I would say so. And so whenever individuals have depression, what they're commonly prescribed is an antidepressant, usually an SSRI or a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So it inhibits the reuptake or reabsorption of serotonin. So there's more available in this synaptic cleft here. So it can continue binding to its receptors to, you know, continue firing an action potential. All right. Now, when it comes to bipolar, lithium is commonly a uh, commonly prescribed, which blocks norepinephrine activity. So it works as an antagonist. Okay, it blocks um, in that regard. So it blocks uh, norepinephrine activity at the synapse from binding to its applicable receptors. All right. Moving forward, when it comes to depression, a couple areas of the brain that may be involved includes the amygdala, which is important in, as we've learned throughout the whole course, emotion processing as well as the fear response more specifically. Um, and so depressed individuals actually react ne uh, to negative emotional stimuli such as sad faces with greater amygdala activation than do non-depressed individuals, as well as they're more prone to react emotionally to negative stimuli. When it comes to the prefrontal cortex, uh, it's involved in regulating and controlling those emotions. So as we learned about in you know, uh, earlier chapters, chapter three with biopsychology with Phineas Gage, he has lim he had his limbic system separated from his, his uh, uh, especially the prefrontal cortex, um, and within that limbic system is the amygdala. So if the amygdala is involved in emotions and you don't have that prefrontal cortex allowing for a filtration to occur, then emotions can fire off rapidly and without regulation.